All right, well, welcome back. We're going to talk about the next section, uh, the next installment here. Uh, we're going to talk about African languages and missing links for Camp Kilimanjaro. Now, I like to have fun, so let's start off with a little bit of fun here. Which of these best matches the biblical Adam of Genesis? The pastoral search committee became concerned with the potential candidate had to think a little too much on this question. <laughs> Sadly, some churches don't think too much about that, do they? Here's another one. Long ages, no. Old age, yes. As I'm getting older, I, you know what, this, this is really true. Hey, I know there's a lot of junior high, high school people out here, some young adults. Hey, do you realize this is true? This is gonna happen to you one day. Uh, years ago, I used to think, ah, oh, that will never happen to me, but it really does, I'm telling you. Uh, you wake up in the morning, you're like, what happened to me? Did I get hit by a bus yesterday or something? I, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'm over 40 years old now, and I'll tell you, I really struggle with some of these things. But let's look at language, okay? Why is language possible in the first place? Did you ever stop to think about that? I mean, we say here, we communicate all the time, left and right. But do we ever stop to think, why is communication possible? Well, consider, the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible is a God of communication. You know, we had uh, perfect communication between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in eternity. Uh, just consider when God created everything, he did it by the word of his power. Genesis uh, 1, 3, for example, here. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. You see, the power of God can even work through the way he spoke. He spoke things into existence. Hebrews 1, 3, uh, speaking of Christ here, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by his word, the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. See, the Lord is upholding all things by the word of his power. You know, God is a God of communication. But consider also, we as mankind, on every continent, whether Europe, Asia, or Africa, you know what, we are made in the image of a communicating God. And so we have that ability as well. We communicate in ways that things like animals simply cannot communicate. Uh, consider how a man communicates with each other. And we can communicate with God because we are made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. You see, we were made to be communicating beings. Adam and Eve, if you look back at the early pages of the scriptures, you know, they spoke back and forth with each other. Uh, Adam spoke with God, by the way. Uh, Adam even wrote a book in uh, Genesis 5.1. So yes, communication, we were made to do that sort of thing. But how many languages is, are there in Africa? You know, we consider just the African continent. I mean, it's a, this is a vast continent. It's pretty good sized. Uh, there's a lot of languages. Uh, there have been linguists who've studied languages in Africa. There's over 2,000 languages spoken in Africa. That's a lot of languages, isn't it, if you stop to think about it? Now, this encompasses about 14 major language families. Okay, here's a map to just kind of show you where some of those language families are. You can see here along the top, there's a pretty big one that goes right down here through the center part. And then you have a whole bunch of different other ones that just kind of float around here. About 14 major ones. Now there's others, uh, you know, where people hop on the continent and, uh, you know, smaller groups that speak different ones. But I, I want to explain what a language family is. Because sometimes you hear, oh, there's 2,000 spoken languages, but 14 language families. What's the difference? Well, what is a language family? A language family is not just like, uh, like we speak in English here. You know, there's Spanish. You know, those are specific, specified languages. Uh, you know, I can speak just a little bit of German, a little bit of French, and I can have enough uh, Chinese to be dangerous in a Chinese restaurant. That's about it. But uh, those are specific languages. Okay, when it comes to language families, it's more broad. Let me explain this with regards to the whole world now. Uh, there's about 7,000 languages spoken in the whole world, and there are at least 78 uh, families that actually came out of Babel with a new language. So here, here's what it is. You take a language, all the different languages that are very similar to each other, and you put them together into one language family, okay? They're just variants within a particular language family. Now, I put this in here. There's at least 78 families that came out of Babel with a new language. So this is like the origin of the language families. Since that time, these language families have varied into uh, what we have today. Let me give you an example. English. Does English change? Yes, English does change. I married an Australian girl. Now, she sounds like a cross between San Diego, Northern Kentucky, and South Carolina. So if you ever meet somebody with that accent, that's my wife, okay? Now, she still uses some Australian words. 
There were, you know, where, right after we got married, she yelled out the window, hey, bring up the esky. And I'm like, what's an esky? Of course, I go to the truck and I grab all this stuff and I go lay it out in the kitchen. I'm going to figure out what an esky is. And so she goes over there and she picks up a cooler, esky from Eskimo for cooler. You know, just different terms. You know, uh, English changes. You might think of British English or Canadian English. Take off, eh? You know? You might think of uh, American English. We tend to butcher the Queen's English, right? Need I mention Tennessee? That's actually a lovely accent, by the way. But then you have Australian. You see, English is always changing. But English is actually a variant of a German language. If we just look at English, going back, say, about 700 years of history. Let's go back 1,000 years ago. If you just look, this is a segment here of Our Father Who Art in Heaven. Look at this. From 1,000 years ago, look how it's, we can hardly recognize it. It almost looks kind of German, doesn't it? And then you can see how it's kind of varied a little bit for, more, and then you go up 700 years later, and you can have it to where we, we kind of recognize it today. But see, there's about 78 language families that came out of Babel, and those languages continue to change. Now, I showed this slide in a previous session. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 10. You have Noah, you have uh, Japheth, you have Shem, and you have Ham, and then you have their sons and, and grandsons and great-grandsons and so on down here. In uh, in Genesis chapter 10, this is where it talks about these different family groups came out with a new language. For example, uh, Genesis 10, 5. From these, the coastline people of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, uh, according to their families, into their nations. Now, we actually see reflections of this in Genesis 10, 20, where it's talking about the sons of Ham uh, going, uh, you know, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands and their nations. Genesis 10, uh, uh, 30, it talks about this of the sons of Shem saying, uh, according to their families, according to their languages and their lands, according to their nations. So people were going out according to this big listing. So as people went to different parts of the world, how do we get all these different languages? You know, they continue to change as they go to different parts of the world. How? I mean, if we just looked at that English, okay, let's just bring that back up for a moment. See how English has changed over 700 years. Do you think other languages are going to change like that too? Absolutely they are. See, English is classed as the German language. The German language family has Austrian in it. It has Norwegian. It has uh, it just a host of different languages. English is actually one of them. So we continue to see these languages change, yet we as uh, English speakers can rarely understand Norwegian or German, or Austrian, you see, because the languages have changed so much. So English is like a specific type within that larger language family, okay? Now, let's, let's just consider something else. There are linguists who study language families all over the place, not just in Africa, but a host of other places. And a couple of different groups, uh, uh, some of the leading ones, say that there's a maximum of about 90 to 100 language families floating around out in the world. Now, these numbers tend to change a little bit because... We have some other languages that some people want to class as a language, some people don't, and they're like, well, what do we do with it? Let me give you an example, Klingon. What do you do with Klingon? It's a constructed language. It's a new language, but there are people out there speaking it. Uh, you know, Esperanto is another one of those. Uh, that's a constructed language. Now nations actually use that, believe it or not. There are uh, some people out there who are born into that language. So there's constructed languages, and then there's some of those debatable ones. You know, what do you do with uh, computer languages? You know, believe it or not, that's actually a type of form of language uh, for communication, for actually uh, uh, to be able to do some programming. You know, some of our uh, IT guys would probably appreciate hearing that. But, uh, you know, see, people kind of range in this. What we're trying to stick with are the actual languages uh, that have been passed down for generation after generation. But notice this. We have at least 78 language families coming out of the Tower of Babel. And there is a maximum of 90 to 100 so you know what? We're right in the ballpark. Let's jump back to this slide here. I want to explain something. Here's why I, I say at least 78. I subtracted off Noah, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, and I also subtracted off Peleg. And the reason for that, it was in the days of Peleg that the earth was divided. These languages were split apart as people went to different parts of the world. That land was divided up amongst them. But see, notice here, if you tally these up, you also have some other sons and daughters in here. Did they come out with the new language family? You know, it's possible. You know, Genesis chapter 11 kind of comments uh, on these uh, other sons and daughters. But then there's, there's some other instances down here. You know, Nimrod remained in B Babylon, took over Babel. And he also had some other uh, uh, early kingdoms or uh, uh, areas that were the first centers of his kingdom. But if you notice this, this is probably named for Babel, right? 
He took over Babel. It may not necessarily be a son, but this is one of his cities, so he's taken it over. Was it a son that he put in charge? We simply don't know. Uh, then we have Eric, Achad, and so on. Were these names of his descendants? You kind of have to have descendants to build a city. But then, you know, the Bible just doesn't give us enough detail. So that's why I say at least 78. But you know what? At least 78 and a maximum of 90 to 100, we are right in the ballpark. Did you ever stop to just think about how close we really were to that? I mean, consider this now just of Africa. You know, we have 14 major language families in Africa. There's a few others, like I said. But look at this. I've actually traced about 14 descendants of Ham to Africa. Now, before you jump to conclusions, thinking, wow, 14 to 14, that matches up beautiful. No, no, no. Uh, let me caveat this. You see, a lot of people have gone to Africa since those early times. For example, South Africa has a lot of European influx into it, and they brought a language family to that. So, you know, there's some other factors here involved as well. But here's what I want to draw out. Compare this to the secular world. In a secular worldview, all the languages came from a single, original, evolutionary ancestor that grunted. Grunt, grunt. All the languages of the world supposedly came from this. Now, this is shocking if you just sit back and think about this. Language is phenomenal. You have languages that read from left to right, right to left, top down. Some are uh, tonal. Some actually are pictorial in the way that they write. Some, I mean, it's just fascinating when we start looking at this. The grammatical structures are completely different. You know, if we just think of some of the European languages. In, in English, we, we may speak like this. I will go to the store. But other languages might do it different. To the store, I will go. You see, I mean, there's a lot of variance in that. How in the world do we get all this from a single grunting language? You know, the Bible makes sense of languages, doesn't it? In the secular world, I think they're grasping at straws to try to come up with some original proto-language. But see, connect this. In the secular world, they say that the original language would have come out of Africa. The reason that they would say it came out of Africa is because that's where they say our ancestors came from. They say people evolved out of Africa. This actually came from Charles Darwin. Uh, this is his book, The Descent of Man. He says, it is therefore more probable that Africa was formerly inhabited by extinct apes, closely allied to the gorilla and chimpanzee. And as these two species are now man's nearest ally, it is somewhat more probable that our early progenitors lived on the African continent than elsewhere. You see, they saw apes on Africa, and so they said, ah, oh, people must have evolved from Africa. And so the languages then transversed, ultimately, from a proto-language in Africa. In fact, this is where they keep looking for missing links, isn't it? That's where they're looking. They're looking in Africa. They're trying to find missing links down here. So that's where they're looking. Now, notice something. Notice these migration routes as people go to different parts of the world. It's like they came out of Africa, went to Babel, and then went all over the world. You know, if they would just turn this line around right here from Babel to Africa, boy, it'd look an awful lot like the Babel dispersion, wouldn't it? Yeah, you see, so they're close in one sense, but the false worldview has led them down the wrong path. Well, I brought up missing links, so let's go ahead and talk about that. Isn't Africa the land of missing links? You see, in the secular worldview, there is a big bang. There was nothing, something pops into existence from nothing, rapidly explodes, and billions of years later, you get all the way up here to where you start getting birds and mammals and things like that. And finally, you have some ape-like ancestor that evolves into what we have today, people, whether on Africa or Asia or Europe or Australia or what have you. And you know what? The world teaches this left and right. It's tough to miss it. You can walk down a grocery store shop and believe it or not, you can see magazines that have these missing links right on the front of it. These uh, artist illustrations. There's another one from Time Magazine. Here's one from National Geographic, Scientific American. The list goes on. Now, I want you to understand something from a big picture here. From a Christian viewpoint, just look at this. Did we evolve from ape-like ancestors according to the Bible? No. We came from Adam and Eve, right, who were specially created which means missing links are not true. That simple. They're not real. Now, people keep saying that there's missing links. We know that that's not true. So how do people make missing links then? Well, there's three ways people try to make a missing link. Okay? First, you take bones from a human, you take bones from an ape, you put them together, and you try to make a missing link. All right? Let's uh, show you an example of this. Piltdown man. Arguably one of the most popular hoaxes that's been floating around out there. But you know, do you realize for 40, 50 years or so, 
Piltdown Man was seen as the ultimate missing link. A group of people actually had studied it. And, and what, what they did is they took bones from a human, bones from an ape, they filed things down, they put it together, and then they didn't let anybody study it but themselves. They said, look, we got a perfect missing link. Look at this. But come to find out it was a hoax. When they actually let people look at it, they're like, look at this. The teeth have been filed down. There's all sorts of things here. There's problems with that. Well, the second way to make a missing link is you take an ape and you try to make it look like a human. You know, a great example of that one is Lucy, the Australopithecine afarensis. Now, here's the bones that was found of Lucy. Now, look closely at the hands and the feet. Yeah, you don't really see them, do you? Now, if you just use a composite, here's what you can come up with. You really can't come up with hands or feet. But you go to museums in various parts of the world. Here's one, if I remember right, was in St. Louis. Look at the hands and the feet. Boy, I tell you what, standing upright, they tried to make this ape look like a human, didn't they? You know, they measured out almost every one of the bones in Lucy. And those bones match almost beautifully with a chimpanzee. The jaw's a little bigger, the carrying angle in the hips a little higher. But other than that, it's, it's basically an extinct chimpanzee. You know, I've seen another one when I was over in Sweden. This was an Australopithecine afarensis. But notice the hands and the feet here. Let's zoom up. Boy, look at that. I mean, a model doesn't have hands that good, do they? <laughs> Here's some feet. Look at that. They put human hands and feet on there. You see what they're doing is they're taking an ape, they're trying to put human features on it, having it stand upright, trying to put all this stuff on there to try to make it look like a missing link. Well, the third way to make a missing link is you take a person and you try to make them look like an ape. A good case example of that is Neanderthal. Neanderthal uh, actually was found in the Neander Valley, which is in Germany. Uh, just so you know, uh, uh, there was a man named Neander uh, who was actually a famous hymn writer who was a Christian, and it was actually on his property that they found this, and that's where it's named for, Neanderthal here. But uh, just to give you an idea, here's what Neanderthal supposedly looked like according to an artist's representation in 1856. Boy, that looks like a missing link, doesn't it? Boy, how can, how can you say it's not? Well, 1983, they've revised it. If you put a hat on him, you wouldn't recognize him from anybody else. Neanderthals, they, they built flutes, they wore clothes, they buried their dead, they, they uh, uh, had worship rituals and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, wearing clothes, by the way, is a Christian doctrine. It goes all the way back to the early pages of Genesis. So, uh, you know, it's mankind that wears clothes. It's not animals that wear clothes. If you go over to uh, the Neanderthal Museum there in Germany, you can see some other depictions here in the background of what Neanderthal may have looked like. But nowadays, they recognize that all the features of a Neanderthal are within the human population even today. They really are. And so they said, you know what? You put a suit on the guy, you wouldn't tell him from anybody else. But you know, I've been fascinated by this image of this one that they've got in here, the way they put him together. Look carefully at this guy. Does he look familiar? That guy looks an awful lot like Dr. Dwayne Gish, a famous creationist who was a debater, I recently passed away. So one of the leading evolutionary missing links, not only did it evolve into a person, it evolved into a creationist. <laughs> I'm telling you, that was brilliant. But do you realize, you know, people have done studies in uh, Neanderthal uh, genetics and uh, 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 just modern human genetics, they, they've interbred with each other. So, of course, uh, they were uh, all part of uh, hu humanity. Here, let me just give you a quote here. Uh, this skeleton, which has some characteristics of Neanderthals and others of moder early modern humans, demonstrates that early modern humans and Neanderthals are not all that different. They intermix, interbred, and produce offspring. That's because we're all part of the same kind. We're all part of the human kind. It's not a missing link at all. You see, when you start looking at these different fossils that people throw out there as missing links, the world has to have their story. So they have to have some ape-like ancestor that gives rise to people, and so they're looking and looking and looking for missing links. But do you realize we're looking at the same evidence? We're looking at the same uh, fossils. We're looking at the same Neanderthals and, and same Australopiths and so on. So we're looking at it from a different viewpoint. See, the Bible, God created things according to their kind. You have your ape kind out there. You have your human kind, okay? We all go back to Adam and Eve. So we have variations within people. That's not a big deal. I look out here and I see variations in people. I see some people who are taller, some people who are shorter, some people who are skinnier, some people who are wider. That's a good way of saying that, right? I see people with dark hair, people with lighter hair, people with lots of hair, people without much hair. 
<laughs> yeah, you kids out in the audience, get ready. It's gonna happen one day. But you see, I wanna encourage you to use the Bible. Start with the word of God when you look at things like these apes. We know we went back to Adam and Eve. God can't be wrong. So you know what? Think biblically. We can see variations within the apes. We see variations within the humans. They are not missing links. So when you see things like this, and it floats around all over the place, I want you to keep in mind, hey, this is an illusion. Let's be able to look through that illusion and see what's wrong with it. But just to give you an idea, let's uh, talk about just a handful of these defunct eight men that are floating around out there. Uh, I already mentioned Neanderthals up here is the fancy name for it. They're simply human. Ramaphthesis, that's just an extinct type of uh, orangutan here. A Piltdown Man, that was the hoax. We'd mentioned that one before. And one of my favorites is Nebraska Man. Uh, you know, I have to tell you about Nebraska Man. Nebraska Man was hailed as a beautiful missing link for a good 40, 50 years as well. And uh, all they had was one piece of evidence. And not only did they draw Nebraska Man, they drew Nebraska Woman. Perfect missing links. Guess what that evidence was? One tooth. One tooth! And then after about 40, 50 years, they studied that tooth and realized it was a pig's tooth. So there went that one. Uh, some of these australopiths here, just a, a kind of ape or extinct chimpanzee here. Homo habilis, that's a junk category. Let me give you an idea what, what homo habilis is. Let's say you got a box, okay? And uh, you're in Africa and you're looking for a missing link and you find a bone, you don't know what it is, you throw it in the box. Well, 100 miles later or 100, 100 miles away, uh, uh, you know, five years later, you, you find another bone, you're like, what is this? I don't know, throw it in the box. After a while, you, get, you got a box full of bones. And so they pull those bones out and they build a missing link. The problem is, that's the same thing as Piltdown Man, except it's not a hoax. They're just trying to put it together, but it's taking bones from an ape, bones from a human, and you're trying to build a missing link. So it's just a junk category. Homo erectus, for example, Peking Man or Java Man, there's, you know, most people say those are fully human. But uh, I want to encourage you guys to study this. Look into it. Because you know what? God's always right. People can be wrong in their philosophies. They can be wrong in their ideas of proto-language and things like that. But I want you to also realize something important. Ideas, like evolution, millions of years, Big Bang, those sorts of things, that are all part of that secular humanistic worldview, that, that particular religion, they have consequences. Let's just look at some of the consequences of an evolutionary worldview. Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. You know who said this? Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, who was an evolutionist. He recognized that when you teach an evolutionary worldview that teaches that there are more evolved and less evolved races, you're going to come out with a racist worldview. And you see, racism exploded, I would suggest, as a result of an evolutionary worldview. Now, don't get me wrong, racism uh, did not come about because of an evolutionary worldview. It was around before that. But when people started to buy into it, they used that to try to justify their racism. Here's Charles Darwin, also writing in, in his book, uh, The Descent of Man, he says, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphic apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. Now, hopefully, I hope you, you, you caught what that quote was saying. Okay? There's a couple of things in here. First off, Charles Darwin was saying, there's, there, there's the Caucasian on top, right? And then he put basically people with darker skin down below. And he said, you know what? If we can exterminate these, well, then we'll have a bigger gap to go all the way down here uh, to, to some, some creature like a baboon. And he's saying that will happen not even in centuries, some future period. You know what? People like Adolf Hitler tried to do it. That's called genocide. He was trying to wipe out Jews, Slavs, Poles, hosts of people, anybody who did not fit with that high level. And see, Hitler was thinking like this. Okay, Darwin put the Caucasians on top. He's gonna put the Aryans out of the Caucasians on top so the other Caucasians can go too. You see, that leads to things like genocide. He's not the only one. We've seen this sort of thing with other people to a lesser degree. Consider also an evolutionary worldview. I was taught these things. I was taught life is an accident, no absolutes, evolution, there's no God, life has no meaning, people are animals. What do you do to a mosquito? What do you do to other people? You know what, we've seen school shootings just erupt because people are taught that other people are simply an animal. Friends, that's murder. 
That's what that is. How different would it be if people would have been taught that the Bible is true, that that evolutionary worldview is a false worldview? It is a false religion that has been imposed upon people. How different would it be if people can look through those missing links? How different would it be if people would actually study languages for what they are instead of trying to look for proto-language? You know, how different would it be if people were taught a correct worldview? You see, friends, I wanna encourage you to get back to the authority of the word of God. Colossians 2.8 says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. You see, a lot of people have bought into what the world is saying, but we as Christians, and I wanna encourage you as a Christian here to get back to the authority of the word of God. Trust what God has to say. Now I understand there's probably people here who are not Christians. If you're not a Christian, we welcome you here. We hope you're having a great time. But friends, we wanna challenge you to consider the claims of Christ because that's what this is all about. We're not just here to talk about languages or missing links. We wanna see you one to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what can we conclude? Well, first off, the Bible makes sense of languages, not just in Africa, but for the rest of the world. You know, it makes sense. You know, we see that maximum of 90 to, uh, to 100 uh, 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 language families out there, and yet we have a minimum of 78. I tell you what, we're right in the ballpark. But you know what? When it comes to missing links, they're simply that. They're missing. You see, we see an awful lot of artist representations of it, an awful lot of news headlines that say, missing link found. What you don't see is the retraction six weeks later, you know, in the fine print. Yeah, I'm not so sure about this. Might just be an ape. Might just be a human. You know what? We need to get back to the authority of the Bible when we look at any skull, any skeleton where somebody claims it's a missing link. But you know what, the Bible makes sense of the languages and the people of Africa, and you don't have to appeal to a secular worldview to do it. 